Coming up on 2020 on ID. Late night traffic stops and a group of women with terrifying stories. And he opened the door, he told me to get out and pull my pants down. So it just got to the point to where I raised up my shirt. Can I go now? He zipped his pants up and walked towards my car thinking he was going to shoot me in the back. Holt Squaw in on the tackle. The accused, a college football standout, a bodybuilder, now a tough guy cop facing the long arm of the law. You have the right to remain silent. His girlfriend standing by him. I feel like it's all a movie, and we're just going to wake up, and it's going to be over. His parents going through their savings to save him. He wanted to catch the bad guys. It's very hard. And he's not the villain that they portrayed him as. Tell that to a dogged detective, his very own colleague, who interrogates him. Nothing sexual on. Nothing sexual. For someone to use the badge and the gun to just do the most demeaning thing, I was going to put him in prison. Gathering physical evidence. There was unknown DNA, female DNA on the inside of his pants. But could she prove her case? Daniel did not do the things that he was charged with. A private eye who says many of the women have their own offenses to hide. We're dealing with a lot of people that their entire life is spent committing crime. We know that she uh, tested positive for PCP and other drugs. And the cop who says that's what makes them an easy target. They are the perfect victim. If you believe them, who cares? But what does the alleged attacker have to say? I want people to hear from me. What the dash cam never saw. Welcome to 2020 on ID. I'm John Quinones. It's something many of us have experienced, the dread of being pulled over by a policeman, maybe going too fast or a taillight that's out. It could be anything. But the women you're about to meet claim one officer in Oklahoma City gave them a very different reason to be afraid. They say he was a predator, using his badge as a shield to commit sexual abuse. It was the word of 13 women against one man. But was it true? Why did it take many of the accusers so long to come forward? Why could some not identify him? As Juju Chang first reported in 2016, in the end, one other woman would play a key role in unraveling the threads of this story. An officer taking on one of her own. Now, what's your first name? Daniel. Daniel. Daniel, I just have to sit in here. Okay. And we'll see what you like. You have to sit there. You've seen the good cop, bad cop routine but never one quite like this. In a tiny overheated interrogation room in Oklahoma City, the good cop, Detective Kim Davis, 28 years on the job, is very good. This is gonna make the rumors go away. And the bad cop, patrolman Daniel Holdsclaw, is allegedly very bad indeed. He's not here to solve a crime, he's the suspect. You have the right to remain silent. You understand that? Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. Oklahoma City has a hardcore cowboy culture and a state capital with its own oil wells. But at night, beyond the blur of traffic and the neon rainbow glow of the Skydance Bridge, there is a dangerous side of the little city on the prairie, the Northeast. Police Chief Bill City knows it well. There's a lot of gang activity. It's a lower income area, and there has been in the past a lot of crime in that area. I'm willing to make a statement and answer questions at this time. I did not want an attorney present this time. Officer Holdsclaw is accused of sexually assaulting a woman he pulled over on the night shift just hours earlier. It's a stunning tumble for a hulking former football hero. Holtzclaw in on the tackle. His loving family says he's always been a gentle giant. His dad, Eric, and mom, Kumiko, and sister, Jenny, have many mementos of his gridiron glory. This is Eastern Michigan. Holtzclaw, nicknamed the Claw by teammates, was a football star in high school and an All-American at Eastern Michigan University. What a story Holtzclaw is. Young man out of Enid, Oklahoma. He excelled in football. He became an All-State player at Enid High. He was recruited to a Division I school. And he wanted to go play in the NFL. He wanted to be a pro football player, and that was his dream. The 2009... The lifelong dream dashed the night of the NFL draft. The Kansas City Chiefs select Tyson Jackson. He just didn't make the cut. It's really competitive. It's the disappointment of a lifetime. Holtzclaw turns from pro football dreams to his second career choice, police work. Here we go. Come on. He continues to stack muscles on his linebacker physique, endless hours in the gym pumping iron. Squeeze. That's where he meets his girlfriend, 
who asked us not to use her name. They bond over barbells and bodybuilding. My best words to describe him is a big teddy bear. I mean, he's really sweet, he's really kind. Mwah. Good night, baby. And religious, too. She says they attended church every week. Daniel would send her Bible verse selfies. Romans 12, verse 10. Love one another with brotherly affection as members of one family. Holdsclaw even had a verse tattooed on his arm. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. They'd only been together six months, but were already thinking about forever. Do you think this was leading to marriage? Definitely. When it came to relationships, Holdsclaw's family says Daniel was pretty much a one-woman guy. He didn't have a lot of girlfriends. He had, he was, what's the word? He's, he had one serious girlfriend, and then uh, he had most of the time through college. He was a monogamous. Yes. Holdsclaw is little more than a rookie, just three years on the job, but already getting a reputation as an aggressive officer, a pair of brass knuckles in his patrol car. A local newspaper says he enjoys chasing down the bad guys as much as opposing running backs on the football field. His dad, Eric Holdsclaw, is a police officer too in the family's hometown of Enid, Oklahoma. I would say he was a proactive police officer. Um, he liked to, to get in the mix. He wanted to catch the bad guys. Uh, he was very proud of that. He wanted to make a difference. Yeah, I've never been in trouble like this before. Never got accused of anything like this. But Holdsclaw is a cop in a tight spot. And we told you that there was a traffic stop, right. that somebody made some allegations against an officer. Right. It's 2 o'clock that morning, off duty, driving home in his police car, which many officers do in Oklahoma City. Holdsclaw makes a traffic stop. Do you make traffic stops normally after work? I don't, but in that case, I saw her swerve and whatnot. Holdsclaw describes a routine stop. No ticket, just a warning about her expired driver's license. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm just off work. I'm tired. Um, get your license taken care of. I cut her loose. After that. Then where'd you go? I went straight home. He admits he never bothered to call it in, and in another violation of procedure, had shut down the communication system in his patrol car, something he says he always did after work. So did you run her on your MDT? No, I didn't. All my, all my stuff as far as that, because I didn't even call it in and say it was a traffic stop, my computer was off and everything as well. But that female driver is telling police a very different story. She says the officer made her expose herself and sexually assaulted her right there in the back of his patrol car by the side of the road. Well, was there anything, an accidental touch of anything? If she thought it uh, when I passed her, Jared, but I, there was nothing as far as I felt like I would do anything as far as sexual or anything like that. Detective Davis had met with the woman earlier that morning. What was your first impression of her? Her makeup was smeared because she'd been crying. I mean, I can see her face right now and the fear in her eyes and in her facial expression. Nothing sexual went on during Nothing. that 15 minutes. Nothing sexual. Holdsclaw's sister says all she sees is a man telling the truth. When you look at the interrogation video, what do you see? That's Daniel. Daniel being honest, straightforward. He had nothing to hide. Detective Davis disagrees. I just thought he was very robotic. He didn't express any shock. No. If I accused you of doing something like this, or if I was accused of something like that, my voice would probably go up 10 octaves, and I'd be like, what? I didn't do that. Did your pants come unzipped, unbuttoned, anything while you were standing right there? No. But after more than two hours cornered in that stifling interrogation room. I don't know if this shirt's gonna be big enough for you here. Big old boy. He stripped of his badge, his gun, and humiliatingly, even his uniform. Standing there in borrowed clothes in that tiny room, Holdsclaw calls his girlfriend. Hey, baby. Babe, I need to <laughs> I need to tell you what's going on. It's crazy. You've just witnessed the end of Daniel Holdsclaw's short career in law enforcement. Hey, uh, until this investigation gets all completed, what's going on? We're going to put you on administrative leave of pay, okay? Sure. Not only is he no longer working for the police, now the police are working against him. When we come back, we'll meet the woman from that nightmare traffic stop. He just picked the wrong lady to stop that night. Yeah. And later, the invisible evidence found on Holdsclaw's uniform, the pivotal clue detectives find on those confiscated pants. Was that a smoking gun in a sense? Stay with us.
In the heart of Tornado Alley in 2014, Oklahoma has an easy year, less than 20 twisters. But in Oklahoma City, the police department is getting slammed with a man-made disaster. Oklahoma City Police confirmed they are investigating this claim. The force rocked by allegations against one of its own. Officer Daniel Holdsclaw is preying on those he's sworn to serve and protect. But now he's the one being pursued by sex crimes detective Kim Davis, and it is personal. For someone to use the badge and the gun to just do the most demeaning thing to a human being, it just, it's infuriating. It was my main focus. I, I was going to put him in prison. The alleged victim, Oklahoma City native Janie Liggins. She runs a daycare center, is 57 years old, a mother of four, and a grandmother of 12. I looked in my rearview mirror, and I noticed the lights, and I know it was a police car. She recalls the night she was pulled over along a section of 50th Street. The officer told her she was driving erratically. And when I opened the door, he came to my car. He said, I stopped you because I thought you were swerving. He starts to question her about a cup of Kool-Aid seen in this police photo and whether she's been drinking. She says she had not. But when the cops start searching her, Ligon says the traffic stop gets weird and scary. She says he orders her to expose herself. I'm like, what? You want me to take my pants down? Then he like, yes, I said, oh, no, sir. I said, you're not supposed to do this, sir. Ligon says Holdsclaw then forced her to commit a sex act on him as he stood by the open rear door of his police car. She was scared to death she was going to die. She didn't look at his face. She didn't look at his name tag. She said all she could stare at was his gun. In his police interview, Holdsclaw acknowledges Ligon's was afraid of him. Did she ever ask you if you were going to shoot her? She did. She was talking about a pistol all the time and talking about guns and whatnot. And I'm like, calm down. I'm like, I'm not gonna shoot you or anything like that. Did she think you were gonna shoot her? Maybe. It's disgusting. And this is my mother who is a grandmother. Liggins' daughter, Latoya Rifa, sat by her mother's side during our interview. And he assumed that he could do this because there's no way she's gonna report him. There's no way nobody's going to believe her. And did he say anything? He just backed up and he zipped his pants up and he moved back and I just got out of his police car and walked towards my car thinking he was gonna shoot me in the back. And he let me live to tell the story. Big, big mistake. Two hours later, encouraged by her family, Liggins reports the assault to the police. If I could have went and found him myself, I would have gladly done so. Terrible. Do you wanna take a moment, you okay? No, fine. Did you believe her? Yes, I did. There was no motive for her to make this up. Detective Scour holds Claw's car for evidence, but find nothing more than fast food wrappers, muscle supplements, and a Justin Timberlake CD. But when they examine Holds Claw's uniform, hoping to find Janie Liggins' DNA, they get a shock. They find DNA all right, but it's not hers, and it's not from Holds Claw's girlfriend either. There was unknown DNA, female DNA on the inside of his pants. Detectives now deduce two things. The unknown DNA may be another victim, and Holds Claw a serial predator. The hunt begins for a match to the mystery DNA. We weren't gonna stop till we found it. Juries today want DNA because everybody watches CSI. Everybody wants the DNA moment. Right. They begin checking the records of Holtzclaw's encounters with other women on his beat. I think we hand searched six paper boxes full of those trying to find everybody he ran. So that's like thousands of names is my oh, assumption. thousands. We just made a list of black females um, that he stopped and ran and started going door to door. Behind those closed doors, and as the investigation widens, just what they feared. They find more women who say they too were attacked by a cop. And when the story leaks... An officer has been placed on administrative leave. Still more women come forward. Take the case of 22-year-old Shardarian Hill who was handcuffed to this hospital bed, high on drugs after an arrest, when she says she was sexually assaulted. I didn't know what to think. I was scared because I was just like, this is a police officer. I didn't know what to do. And then I'm handcuffed to the bed, so I'm just like. You're powerless. Yes, I'm in his custody. I, I don't know what he might do next, so I just didn't even say nothing. And then there's Carla Raines, a 45-year-old mother of two, who says she was forced to expose herself by an officer, supposedly checking for drugs or weapons. So it just got to the point to where I raised up my shirt. Okay, 
Can I go now? Can you let me go? Why didn't you report it? I didn't think that anything would happen. And then the police tracked down this woman, 39-year-old Sherry Ellis. She tells a now familiar story. She was walking down Highland Drive when she was stopped by a cop in a squad car. And that's when he started doing um, things that he shouldn't be doing. What kind of things did he do? Uh, he was, when he searched me, he searched under my clothes. He patted me down up under my clothes. Ellis says the officer ran her name and found she had an arrest warrant and multiple unpaid fines. He's like, well, okay, uh, what do you think we need to do about this, Miss Ellis? And I said, I don't know. Are you going to take me to jail? And uh, I was looking down because I said in the back of my mind, oh, my God, I'm going to jail, you know? And when I looked up... When she looked up, she says the officer forced himself on her. But her ordeal would not end there. Afterwards, she says he drove her to this abandoned schoolyard. He drove me to, uh... Um... He drove me to, uh... To a school. And, uh... And I started the school in the back. And he opened the door and he told me to get out and pull my pants down and um, and allegedly assaulted her again. When it was over, he said I was free to go. And now police are connecting all those cases, the women, African-American, and mostly middle-aged, to that young, all-American, clean-cut cop, Daniel Holdsclaw, an officer allegedly leading a double life on the night shift. Two months after his interrogation, he is arrested in the parking lot outside his gym. Police officer arrested Officer Daniel Holtzclaw is in custody tonight with several women coming forward claiming to be his victims. They have Holtzclaw. They also have a growing list of accusers. But there's a problem. Not one of the women is a match to that critical clue, the mystery female DNA found on the uniform. We kept going and kept searching because we had to find a match. When we come back, something else that's not adding up. Is it possible police are chasing the wrong man? Your description doesn't match Daniel Holtzclaw. Stay with us. A single claim of sexual abuse against Daniel Holtzclaw has snowballed as more and more women come forward to say they, too, are victims of the police officer. But as investigators work to build a case, they're about to find out not all the pieces of this puzzle neatly add up. Once again, Juju Chang. Why in the world would she make this up? I don't know. I was, she was cooperative. She was nervous. You know what? If this is a bunch of false allegations, then I want it cleared up, too. Right. From that claustrophobic interrogation room where Officer Daniel Holdsclaw insisted on his innocence to the urban Oklahoma City neighborhood called the Northeast, Detective Kim Davis and her colleagues were working furiously to investigate a ballooning number of sexual assault allegations against the policeman. Three, six, 12, and finally, 13 women. What was the pattern of behavior when he would stop a woman, um, a potential victim? He would check their background first, and if it was convictions, drug use, prostitution, then, I, then he would target them. He would say, well, I need to search you. I need to make sure you don't have, and it would kind of start from there. As Holtzclaw begins preparing a defense, his family hires private investigator Brian Bates. I can confidently say Daniel did not do the things that he was charged with. Bates is well known in Oklahoma City as a video vigilante for posting videos of prostitutes and their customers caught in the act. Hey, Debbie. What are you doing? Running off the prostitution going on. He says because nearly all Holtzclaw's alleged victims have a history of drug abuse, prostitution, or outstanding warrants, they're not to be believed. We're dealing with a lot of people that their entire life is spent committing crimes. It's just a simple fact. Lying is second nature to committing these crimes. So I know that you have a criminal record. Yeah, but I don't really want to talk about that. You don't want to talk about it? Mm -mm. They are the perfect victim. Nobody's going to believe them. If you believe them, who cares? They're prostitutes. A prostitute can't be raped. Yes, they can. Yes, they can. So that's why he was picking these kind of women, because that's the perfect victim. Perfect victims, but far from perfect witnesses. The
the Holtz Club private eye, Brian Bates, plays me several police interviews he says prove the women are not credible. Remember Carla Raines, the woman who says she was forced to expose herself? In her police interview, at first, she repeatedly denies she's a victim at all. Have you ever come to any contact where an officer has been inappropriate? No. You ever had to expose yourself to him? No. Five times, she says, she's not a victim. Another alleged victim can't pick Holdsclaw out of a lineup. That's him. Okay. I think. Okay, well, let me, well, I've got several photographs to show you, so. I'm not really sure. She couldn't identify Holdsclaw in a photo lineup. Right, they don't look at their face. Perhaps the most bewildering inconsistency, Holdsclaw is six foot two with white and Japanese parents. But Sherry Ellis tells detectives the man who assaulted her in a schoolyard was a short black man. Tell me your description of him. He's black. He's okay. He's a black male. Muscular. Muscular. Is he taller than you or shorter than you? Like right here, maybe. Like that. So you think he's shorter than you? Yeah. You describe him as being like this to you, right? Mm -hmm. And you're about 5'10"? 5'11". 5'11"? Yeah. Daniel Holesclaw's like 6'2". Oh, see? I still didn't know that. I mean, that's kind of a big difference, right? Yeah. Well, I really doesn't, didn't pay any attention. I really didn't. I just knew it was being done to me. Does this trouble you at all, that the descriptions are so far off? No. Can you imagine going through that? trauma and then trying to remember how tall he was, how much he weighed, what did he look like when you're being sexually assaulted? You know, that's the last thing on your mind. Among their many other problems, most of the 13 accusers never reported the sexual assaults. Why do you think all the other women stayed silent? Because of their lifestyle and their relationship with the police department. But one woman did not stay silent. Remember Janie Liggins, daycare worker and grandmother? She went to police right away, within hours. How did she describe the attacker? She said that he was big, muscle bodybuilder big. She thought he had blonde hair. Once he started doing the things he was doing, she was afraid to look at his face and she was afraid to look at his name tag because she thought if he saw, if he saw her doing that, that he would kill her. She may have gotten the hair color wrong, but not the color of his car. She describes an all-black squad car, which turns out to be an important detail. At that time, we were in the process of converting over to all-black. Most of our cars were still black and white. One of the few officers driving a solid black car at the time, Daniel Holdsclaw. So in your mind, she was credible? Yes. But what about his credibility? When we come back, we'll hear what the former All-American athlete has to say for himself. I want people to hear from me. Our interview with the disgraced police officer, Daniel Holdsclaw, next. If the allegations against former Oklahoma City police officer Daniel Holdsclaw are true, he is a serial sex offender, a predator who used his power and position to prey on women. And this is with his patrol car. Yeah, he was very proud. But that is not how the Holdsclaw family sees it. There's just no way. There's not a fiber in my body that believes he did it. In his boyhood home in Enid, Oklahoma, he's still the hero with his own personal hall of fame in a corner of the living room. His biggest fans, his parents, and sister Jenny. He's such a loving brother. He has such a big heart. Happy birthday. To them, he is forever the pistol-packing birthday boy, the perfect prom date, anything but the prime suspect in a series of notorious crimes that revolted the country. Officer Holtzclaw, do you have anything to say? What's it like watching your son be portrayed as a monster, a serial rapist, a predator? It's very hard. He, he's just like you and me. He's just a man. And he's not the villain that they portrayed him as. Could it be that you're a father blinded by love? I'm a father blinded by love, obviously. But I'm also a, a police officer. I've also tried very hard to look at all the evidence and all you have is their allegations and Daniel's word. Everything else is just circumstantial. 
To fund their son's defense, the Holdsclaw say they have emptied bank accounts and asked for donations. Eric Holdsclaw has indefinitely delayed plans to retire. Hello? Please take calls from an inmate at a correctional facility. Hello? On a scratchy phone line from behind bars, it's the accused calling, Daniel Holdsclaw. Officer Daniel Holtzclaw sexually abusing several women while he was on duty. The object of so much public scrutiny and score about to speak publicly for the first time. Daniel Holtzclaw had told 2020 he wanted to talk on camera, but authorities will not allow it. They say for his own safety, a former cop behind bars is a target. What made you want to talk to us? I want people to hear from me. How do I respond to these uh, questions? So they can see the truth. I have nothing to hide. You say you're not guilty. You're telling me you never raped any of those women. Absolutely. Have you ever sexually assaulted any woman? I have never sexually assaulted anyone. Holtzclaw says not only did he not commit these crimes, there were no crimes. He insists the women, all 13 of them, are lying. He claims none of them were sexually assaulted by anyone. Why would 13 women lie? The detectives were approaching the women and say, we have a tip that they've been sexually assaulted by a police officer. They went out and sought these people and planted the idea that, oh, we're investigating this officer that we think may have assaulted you. Could it be that you reverse engineered the investigations and put the power of suggestion into some of these potential victims' heads? You could do that. I mean, I guess, but I didn't. Investigators say the victims' claims of where they were assaulted are backed up by the locator in Holdsclaw's car. Oklahoma City Police Chief William City. Where he took them and the incident happened, we could prove that they were telling the truth by using that GPS and identifying the exact spot. It, it, it proved that they were being truthful. But Holtzclaw's investigator, Brian Bates, disputes that. All the GPS proves is that they came into contact with each other. It certainly doesn't prove that a crime was committed because here's the problem. If that becomes your measure for a sexual assault, Anyone who has ever pulled over anywhere by a police officer can simply pick up the phone and say, this officer did something inappropriate with me. They look it up, oh, GPS says he was there with you for 10 minutes. Well, he must have done something inappropriate because we have GPS. It doesn't make any sense. In our interview, Holdsclaw freely admitted that he did have interactions with all of the women, but he wasn't committing crimes, he says. He was trying to solve them develop sources, locate drug houses, and help some of the women straighten up. Why were you putting these women in the back of your car? Because investigators say that's not only bad police work, but it's dangerous. That's good police work. You run warrant searches, you can talk to them, you find some intel based on what their stories are, to see if it matched up. Police also point out that Holtzclaw violated protocol after one of those traffic stops. After Holtzclaw allegedly assaulted Shardarian Hill, he actually friended her on Facebook. These are some of his messages. Making sure you're doing okay and staying out of trouble, reads one message. And on at least five occasions, he asks her to call him. We don't Facebook friend people we put in jail. That's just stupid. And when his girlfriend found out about it later, even she wondered about that. Did you think it was weird that he Facebook friended one of the women? Yeah, I didn't understand that at first when I asked him, you know, why would you do that? And he said he was just trying to help her and I was just trying to be a good guy and make sure she was okay. But it's not just that you Facebook friended her, you went to her house in your personal car. Why would you do that? Basically just check up on her, make sure she's okay. No, I should have not done that, I was wrong. I did not do anything to her. I did not come on to her. That is not what Shardarion says. And when he got there, he was trying to get me to have sex with him. Police continue hunting for the most incriminating evidence of all, that elusive mystery victim, the DNA from Holdsclaw's uniform pants. Kim Davis and other detectives searched through records of every person Holdsclaw checked for outstanding warrants. So it was gumshoe detective work? Yeah, it was just hitting the streets, putting on our tennis shoes and going. And then the tennis shoe detective work pays off. Detective Kim Davis locates a girl who may be the most important witness of all, a 17-year-old. Holtzclaw had given a ride home just hours before pulling over Janie Liggins. The teenager tells police Holtzclaw assaulted her, too. He started, like, touching me like this, and he put his hands on one of my clothes and started fiddling on me. Did he say anything then? He was like, well, 
you know you're at work, so I don't want I don't have to take you to jail today. So this is what you're gonna have to do. Davis then swabs the teen's mouth, collecting a DNA sample. To compare to any DNA that we've got on his clothing. They send it off to the lab and bingo. It's a match, confirming that her skin cells were found inside the fly of Holtzclaw's pants. He says there's an innocent explanation. He may have picked up the girl's DNA searching her and then transferred it to his pants during a bathroom break. The DNA was skin cells. They didn't test for vaginal fluid. They didn't test for sperm. They didn't test for anything other than skin cells. And so what you're saying is he might have had physical contact, but it wasn't of a sexual nature. Right. But the police are certain that DNA is going to put him away. When you got that DNA match, what went through your head? Well, I said I was going to do a backflip off my file cabinet, but I didn't. <laughs> oh, I was just ecstatic because that was the DNA moment. When we come back, the high stakes holds clock case comes to court. Everybody's got to leave the floor. And Oklahoma City braces for a storm. 32 counts no, Truth and justice. It's important to note that the officer was a white officer. Black and white. And the only things black in the courtroom was the 13 black women in the judge's robe. Watch what happens next. trial begins in the serial sexual assault case against Oklahoma City police officer Daniel Holdsclaw. Coming to us from Oklahoma. The former police officer Daniel Holdsclaw. Half the world is watching. And the other half, it would appear, trying to get a good seat in the courthouse. Here's what's going on right now. About 100 people cramming, elbowing, and pushing their way into the courtroom. Everybody's got to leave the floor. Go in the library. The former officer facing 36 counts of sex crimes against 13 women, carrying a term of several life sentences. We believe you! We believe you! Outside the courthouse, protests. 32 counts! No, man! 32 counts! No, Sometimes so loud, juror Dan Speaks says everyone inside the courthouse could hear them. At one point, the judge it delayed the, the hearing and told us to basically ignore it. We have a problem when it comes to African Americans and the police officers. It's important to note that the officer was a white officer. Hands up! Don't shoot! In the wake of the 2014 riots in Ferguson, Missouri, and the Black Lives Matter protests, the racial overtones in the case are only heightened when the jury is selected. Consisting of eight men, four women, all of them white. They're all white. You started to get concerned about, here we go again. Here we go again, you had an all-white jury, and the only things black in the courtroom was the 13 black women in the judge's robe. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Holtzclaw tells me his theory on the phone, that the police department manufactured a case against him to satisfy the public outcry. We want life! 36 counts! We want life! Why do you think the police intentionally railroaded you? If they didn't convict me, there would be the next Ferguson bill happening in Oklahoma City. And so far, we have heard from three of the alleged victims, but there are still 10 more that we haven't heard from. As expected, Holdsclaw's defense attorney, Scott Adams, attacks the credibility of the 13 accusers. Some of the women were in jail on other charges during the trial and testified in their orange jumpsuits. Some changed their stories. And then there was the one who came to court to testify high on drugs. We know that she uh, tested positive for PCP and other drugs. He knew this. He, he patrolled those streets day in, day out. He knew they might not stand up in a court of law. He, he knew they would not stand up in a court of law, and that's what he was banking on. How difficult is it to mount a case where you have witnesses showing up high on PCP, you have witnesses with a history of lying to the police? These are not easy witnesses to put on the stand. No, it was horrible, and plus it gives the defense just a million things to attack. But the first woman Detective Kim Davis interviewed, the grandmother, Janie Liggins, was not like the others. No long criminal history, no record of addiction or prostitution. Let me ask you about Janie Liggins. She immediately reported the event after it occurred. Why would she make that up? Let's get the factual facts out there. She, she's not innocent what people think she is. She had a, a bus in the 80s, but we're going to present that to the jury. 
Yeah, but yeah. how does a 30-year-old drug bust, how is that relevant to a rape case? Credibility. It's her credibility. This is, a, this is not a, a woman that's, you know, a, a soccer mom or, you know, someone that's credible in society. Janie Ligon says she wasn't even charged in that arrest in the 80s, and she's never been in trouble since. The thing is he's been stopping a lot of prostitutes and drug users, and I guess apparently he thought I was one of them with big, big mistake. He just stopped the wrong lady that night. He stopped the wrong lady that exactly. night. Exactly. It wasn't like these women were trying to say, I want to go make myself the subject of a, a rape investigation. In fact, they were doing the opposite of that, many of them. They said, nobody's going to believe us. Why even bother? Before the trial is even over, well-known civil rights attorney Benjamin Crump is already planning the next case. I will be representing them in civil litigation for them to get whole justice. justice Lawsuits on behalf of the alleged victims. Even before the trial ended, they all lined up. They all were looking for the money trail on this. Detectives were approaching these women saying that you you know, basically give him a lottery ticket, and all he had to do was just say yes. What do you mean by they handed him a lottery ticket? So all he had to do is to go throughout the court case, cooperate, go on stand, and then now they're going to be, you know, billionaires for something, you know, that I didn't do. He has nothing to the hide. The defense called only one thing. witness, Holdsclaw's girlfriend. Why would he do it with these people? You know, if he wanted to go out and sleep around with people, he could go find people on the north side or people where he's from. It just doesn't make sense. Because it's not about sex. It's about power and control. It's all about, look what I can do to you. And you can't do anything about it. The trial runs six weeks. As the jury goes into deliberations. The jurors have been told to make arrangements today for possible sequestering. The Holtzclaw team is feeling confident. We had good feelings in our hearts that he was going to be acquitted dramatic scene in Oklahoma City. I can tell you there is a lot of anticipation in the second floor of this courtroom right now. That jury deliberating now roughly for five hours. That all-white Oklahoma City jury deliberates very deliberately, day after day and deep into the night. Four days, a courthouse record for the longest sequestered jury in county history. After so long, we felt like we were brought together. Somebody, a higher power, brought us together for for a purpose. Juror Dan Speaks says for all the talk of race and the threat of riots outside the jury room, it did not come up inside. He says at first, a number of them were ready to set Daniel Holtzclaw free. They just didn't believe some of those women. There was some jurors that do the fact that who these victims were uh, had a hard time believing, believing them. For the last five weeks, Daniel Holtzclaw has walked into this courtroom and his face has remained expressionless. Finally, the jury returns. They have verdicts on all 36 counts. The judge silently scans each page of the jury form. Daniel Holtzclaw is visibly shaking in his boots, seemingly paralyzed with fear, despite claiming he anticipated a favorable outcome. Were you convinced that they were going to find you not guilty? I absolutely 100%. Uh, all in my heart, within my family, within everyone that was on my side, they all said there's no way that you be, should be convicted. And then the judge begins to read out Daniel Holdsclaw's fate. Defendant is guilty of the crime of sexual battery and set punishment at eight years. Defendant is guilty of the crime of procuring lewd exhibition and punishment is set at five years. Defendant is guilty of the crime of forcible oral sodomy and punishment is set at 20 years. And as the guilties pile up, physically pushing down on Daniel Holdsclaw, the powerful former football star, the aggressive rookie cop, collapsing before the eyes of the courtroom. Defendant is guilty of the crime of rape in the first degree and punishment is set at 30 years. His family stunned. His tearful reaction to the verdict made some people think, oh, well, that's, those are tears of an innocent man. Now, those are tears of a man that got caught and he's not remorseful. He's just sad that he got caught and he's being punished. It was one of the worst abuses of authority in my 38 years that I've really seen.
defendant is not guilty of the crime of procuring lewd exhibition. But the jury did have doubts, Count finding Holtzclaw not guilty on 18 counts, fully half the charges against him, including the allegations involving Carla Raines, Shardarion Hill, and three other women. Even so, Holtzclaw is sentenced to 263 years behind bars. He makes eye contact with the jurors, sending him to prison for the rest of his life, something he calls a slow death sentence. He has a message for them. I looked at him, I looked at him every single one of their eyes, and I told him I did not do this. Dan Speak says based on what he heard in court, the Holtzclaw team just never convinced him that the young officer was innocent. There was no defense. The defense was to defame the victims. The fact that there were so many victims saying what they were saying resonated with me that I don't think they're making this stuff up. Let's talk about the sentence, 263 years. Absolutely. That is, that's a statement. It's a statement. They wanted him buried. Holtzclaw's last day of freedom falls on, of all days, his 29th birthday. In the halls of the courthouse, gleeful supporters of his victims celebrate with a sarcastic serenade. Happy birthday to you. Yeah. The woman who did more than anyone to make this day happen, sex crimes detective Kim Davis, says she will never forget the other woman, Janie Liggins. Janie Liggins says you're a hero. No, I just did my job. She's the hero for coming forward. If she wouldn't have come forward, I don't know where we'd be today. Seven months after the Holtzclaw trial ended, Kim Davis retired from the Oklahoma City Police Department. As of 2017, Daniel Holtzclaw is appealing his conviction. His sister Jenny tells us he's doing well and receives regular visits from his family. Meanwhile, Janie Liggins and 11 of the other women have filed a total of seven civil lawsuits against Daniel Holtzclaw and the city of Oklahoma City, seeking damages. Among the claims are that the city knew of a prior allegation against Holtzclaw and neglected to take sufficient action. Several of the suits also ask for a court order for Oklahoma City police to receive sexual assault training and wear body cameras. As of 2017, Oklahoma City continues to contest the claims. Daniel Holtzclaw has declined to respond.